Thank you. Um, the next and final example is Hammerby, which has been called um, Sweden's Green Utopia. And it's another industrial site that has been turned into um, more of a green residential living space. And they currently have 6,000 residents, and by 2015, when it's completed, they'll have um, over 11,000 residents. And they also will provide um, 35,000 jobs. Um, one thing that they have is a central plant that takes all of the combustible waste, burns it, and then turns it into energy, which fuels 70% um, of the heat and electricity to all of the homes in um, Hammerby. And then the rest of the um, fuel comes from wastewater, which also is processed through a central treatment plant. And this is just um, a layout of Hammerby showing you like where the tram line wit is, which is number two, and you can see how it cuts through um, the area, so it greatly reduces the need for cars. Um, and then it also points out different sections, like where the park is, where the schools are, um, and all of that. Just It's designed in a way that really facilitates green living for the residents. And so what makes it possible for um, Swedes to integrate like green living um, throughout their daily lives, whereas like the U.S. we have to really think about it and we have our little green guides and all of that. Um, one thing is that the Swedes believe it's cheaper and more efficient to provide the green heat and power through a central location like the treatment plants and like the um, combustible power plants or waste treatment plant. Um, they also are doing a great deal of like, coordination and planning through the government and through the um, utility companies, where there are only like one um, electrical company and one wastewater treatment company. So it allows for this centralization. And they have the centralized infrastructure, whereas in the US and the UK, we have all these different um, private companies that are doing different things, and it's much more harder um, for us to coordinate these efforts. So um, to look at these different cultural dimensions, we have the um, Hofstad graph here. And the first column looks at, um, let's see, like uh, culture's acceptance of inequalities. So the Swedes are much less likely to accept inequalities between um, like lower classes and upper classes than what we are in the US. And this um, is true between like families as well as organizations. So this um, really facilitates collaboration. And another thing that facilitates collaboration is um, the second point, where they're less individualistic and focus more on the greater community than themselves. And then the fourth column um, focuses on risk aversion. And as you can see, Swedes are um, less averse to risk than Americans are. So this provides an environment where they're more responsive to change and new ideas, and this really fosters um, an innovative um, clean tech environment. And then the final one is um, a long-term outlook. And Swedes do have a greater long-term outlook than Americans, which allows them um, to really focus on the long-term investment required for, um, these invest for these technologies. And Justin will tell you more about the U.S. trade. Okay. Um, traditionally, the U.S. has been a very free trade oriented society, and that generally comes into play mostly with the clean tech industry as well. Um, what we've found is that green imports, though, are heavily dependent on a lot of government factors. Um, depending on government policy, there could be a, a big increase in the market for importing wind turbines or ethanol. Um, an example for this is uh, renewable energy. Um, and some of this is going to be probably hinting a little bit about some of the other groups and what they're going to be getting into, so we'll kind of go relatively quick through it. Uh, there are, from 1992, there's been a production tax credit for renewable energy on both solar and wind energy of 2.1 uh, cents per kilowatt hour produced. Um, and that's led, led to some innovation, but we've seen a lot of increases in but specifically wind farms, because that production tax credit has been able to then roll over into a 
30% investment tax credit that actually functions more like a grant for people invest in wind farms. Um, the U.S. has a goal for uh, renewable energy production of 25% by 2025, but there's no official renewable energy standard, and that's been viewed as kind of a hindrance to the development of uh, a renewables market and the imports of renewables. Um, some policy things that have been proposed. Uh, 2007, there was a, a WTO proposed uh, free trade agreement on green products. Uh, and I believe those green products were specified by uh, the UN, I think. Um, but it ended up being de uh, vetoed by developing countries uh, because of perceived opportunities for abuse of the system. Also because it didn't include ethanol in the free trade agreement. And so uh, Brazil was able to, Brazil had a, had a vested interest in, in seeing it fail. Um, we, we found uh, this example, the, there's a bilateral agreement on alternative energy cooperation signed by the US and Sweden. And that's actually just a research uh, cooperation between US universities and Swedish universities where they share this information on biofuels and transportation. The two big uh, import tariffs that we found on green tech is the ethanol, 54 cents per gallon import tariff, and that's had a big effect on the ethanol market here in the United States. Uh, it's, been, it's been said that this is one of the major factors driving the US ethanol industry, otherwise we would probably be importing all which makes it much cheaper. Um, it's it's uh, expected to lapse, or it, it's set to lapse, I believe, in July right now, but they just, we read an article just yesterday about how they're fighting to extend, the, extend this to continue to develop the ethanol market in the United States. Um, and so this is a hindrance for people that want to import ethanol actually into the United States, but we in this we see an opportunity for our company, Taurus Energy, which is uh, importing the technology to produce ethanol within the United States. Um, another one that just came actually just came out last year and it kind of uh, was unexpected because they found a component within solar panels is that there's a 2.5 percent ad valorem tariff on solar panels. Um, this is especially sensitive because solar panels have gone down in value uh, as the technology has has continued to develop. Um, so they've been particularly sensitive to the recession, and they were very sensitive to what was then uh, a $70 million backlog in uh, import tariffs. Uh, as we said, federal incentives really drive the market for, uh, for imports in the United States. Uh, the tax credits we talked about for when, there's a federal loan guarantee program for renewable development uh, where, where the federal government will guarantee 50% of the cost of the new venture. Um, there's also ethanol production tax credits, which is uh, 45 cents a gallon made within the United States. So as you see, it's heavily, uh, the government's heavily involved with ethanol production. Um, and then we have two kinds of bonds. We have CREBS, tax exempt clean renewable energy bonds, and energy conservation bonds. And basically these uh, are offered by state and local governments or, or energy cooperatives, that kind of thing, to fund their renewable projects. Uh, debated policy that could end up having a big effect on, on, uh, on importing uh, green tech into the United States. One is feed-in tariffs for renewable energy, which is basically a tax on other forms of energy to pay for renewables. Uh, obviously, that would have a big effect on the demand for, for the infrastructure. Um, a federal renewable energy standard, as we spoke, of, but many states have some have one of their own, but the United States as a whole does not have one. We do have the goal, but no no hard hard set goal, uh, hard set standard in place. Um, obviously, if cap and trade ever made it through, it would dramatically increase the market for uh, importing renewable energy. Um, and I think that concludes our presentation today. Thank you. Thank you.